Daniel, I'll, I'll start with you. The possibility of, to use, uh, to channel Carl from the last hour, the possibility of QE4 here, given this economy, given where we are in markets, shocking to you or would it make sense? I don't think it makes sense. And I think the jobs data this morning reflected that we're still seeing a pretty healthy economy. Wages are growing. Let's see what happens with China. Maybe we'll reach some type of modest deal where we get China buying more of our, our commodity goods, soy, exports, uh, uh, natural gas. But I don't think we need to be doing more cuts today. And Brian, I'm going to put the same question to you, especially given the fact that we did have that strong jobs report this morning. I know you're an Uber bull, and we've seen basically a reigniting, if you will, of the reflation trade this week. Yeah, we have, but it's really been all about a continuation of, of further diversification, we believe, uh, of customers' holdings and, and how they're managing their money. Last year we were so concentrated, and now we've seen a broadening out of the rally. We do think that um, this is about stability, and we've said it several times that we really think that 2019 is this generation's 1995. In 1994, the Fed misstepped. The Fed clearly misstepped in December. Uh, we've had a Goldilocks scenario that developed that many people that we talk to in the marketplace haven't been around. They don't know who Goldilocks is. We've taken care of a couple of the bears. One of the bears was the potential earnings recession. The second bear uh, was the Fed misstep. We already had that. And so uh, we believe that this is all about stability. And we're with uh, Daniel that we don't believe that the Fed uh, can, will, and should uh, cut rates. We think that this is going to be about stability, stability in Fed policy, stability in the econ uh, economic backdrop, and most importantly, stability in the stock market with respect to what profits are and the performance of the U.S. You said we put the recession, earnings recession story to bed. Yeah. No, that's not. That's nowhere near bed yet. Yeah, right? it is. I mean, we're yeah, going to be negative is. this quarter, and who knows about Q2? Uh, we're, how do you know we're going to be negative this quarter? Well, analysts expect. Oh, analysts expect. Yes. This. Carl, these are the same analysts, okay, that missed, uh, missed the fourth quarter pullback, the same analysts that dropped numbers so substantially. We've been having, uh, as a strategist for the last 25 years, I've had this model looking at earnings revisions. And in January, we wrote about this, that we've never seen earnings revisions drop to as negative as they were in ever in, in, in history. Quarter. History, yeah. right? So guess what happened in March? Earnings revisions have gone up again. So I think the likelihood of an earnings recession is excessively low. The market was reactive and too negative on this earnings recession, and everybody sold. It's just this lack of perspective and such a short-term bias on investors these days. We just we've forgotten how to. Are you going to defend Mike Wilson on this? I would just add on a more cautious tone and, and supporting Mike's view. It's that the bar is much higher coming into this first quarter reporting season than we were at the Christmas lows when companies were coming out and they were originally revising down some expectations. So at 2,900, we think we're a bit stretched, particularly uh, given where we see first quarter earnings. Yeah, yeah I, I want to go more into the impact of the president continuing to jawbone the Fed this way. Is there, first of all, is there any interpretation of this other than President Trump trying to stack the economic deck in his favor? I don't know anybody who thinks at this point QE4 makes logical sense. Uh, that's a possibility, and maybe, maybe potentially he's feeling out some uh, potential negative surprise with China. Obviously, we're getting closer and closer, we think, to a deal there. But maybe he's seeing something behind the curtain that we're not seeing as a, as a negative expectation. So I wonder, then, what's the investor's smart response going forward to the president's pushes against the Fed? Because you could argue the Fed reacted to him, although I'm sure the Fed would say, no, we didn't, but the, the, and that he, what he said before made sense. This time, he's a lot further out on a limb. I think the Fed was reacting more to what markets were doing and what financial conditions were doing back at Christmas. But to a broader extent, I think what investors should be doing is thinking longer term. And what we've been advocating is you want to buy offense and defense today and not overpay. The challenge today is defense is really expensive. The challenge is that we're late cycle. So if you just want to go pure offense, we don't think that's necessarily a good idea. So we're buying ideas like Raytheon, Intel, McDonald's, stocks that have a little combination of some offense catalysts that are not overly expensive and also defensive business models. Brian? Where, whereas you are, Brian? Well, you know, we believe that the stock market is a market of stocks. And I think the more <laughs> you think growth versus value, uh, offense versus defense, 
uh, GARP versus not. I think this is about buying ideas again. This is about buying management teams and products and cash flow. And we have the best companies in the world right here in the United States. And so, yeah, it's good that we're seeing a bottoming out of, of global growth. That's awesome. But you know what? We don't need massive global growth for the United States to work in terms of the stock market. We've got our best names right here. So focus on those names with steady earnings, great cash flow, and great brands. Quickly, is it about buying FANG again? I mean, tech stocks have rallied pretty big this year. We would say that um, we own parts of FANG and the seven portfolios that we run for BMO. And I would tell you this, we want to buy those FANG stocks with discernible earnings, great cash flow, and some sort of a brand appeal to them. So yeah, we own those, right? But I'm not saying to have four, five, six, seven percent positions. Have your core position and then trade around that. That's how you invest in these types of markets.